Okay, gang. Ooh. In, <clears throat> excuse me. In this case, we really got to let it breathe. We are on a very janky connection on my side. So long story short, by the way, guys, welcome into the Huddle Up podcast presented as always by Mile High Huddle, powered by Overtime Media. I'm your host, Chad Jensen, but I might be your temporary host tonight. Zach might be the one that has to carry tonight's show 100% because the internet in my neck of the woods is completely down. The Wi-Fi is down. All the service in my neighborhood, in the city, down. So I'm going off of my phone's mobile hotspot right now to my laptop. Zach, we're rolling with the punches, and we just got to let everybody know that I might have to get out of this. If it starts breaking up and being crappy, I just got to get out and, you know, that we got to preserve the quality of the show as best we can. Yeah, last couple of days, Chad, the internet gods are not in our favor with Christie's technical difficulties yesterday and your internet today. But for right now, you're kind of stable. I know it might not last, but for right now, you're looking pretty good. But push comes to shove. I've done it before. I'll do it again, no problem. Just want to talk some Broncos football tonight. Absolutely. And guys, I just want to shout you out for your patience. <clears throat> it's been a long time since we've had to kick back the start of the show by as much as an hour. So thank you for your patience and thank you for hanging out in the chat and rolling with us and just being there. We're going to dive into tonight's show. However, after talking about it, because we don't know how good the quality of my connection is going to be at any given moment, I might have to pop out because of that. We're not going to go through our 7k week top fives on for Elway. We're, I was going to share with you my top five Elway moments dating all the way back to 83 Zach had his top five Bronco moments from 2015 on. We're going to put a pin in that for Wednesday night. By Wednesday night, it'll everything will be just fine. So tonight we want to talk about, Zach, I don't know if you got a chance to see ESPN's uh, NFL Nation did their redraft with Jeff Legwald drafting for the Broncos, but it, it had some uh, curious decisions. Yeah, I, Drew Locke's drawing a lot of slander for his ranking, and uh, you know, rightfully so. I think there's more proven quarterbacks and more proven players at this point. The entire uh, the concept of a redraft throw, I'm not really the biggest fan of these kind of things, Chad. Uh, it, it's basically offseason fluff material. You can't have any do overs in the NFL, and, and speculating about it um, is just, I, I think, uh, mental masturbation in, in, to some degree. So um, I understand why a lot of condemnation is coming Drew Locke's way, but the slander around this guy from top to bottom, even from Browns fans comparing him to Baker Mayfield. What have the Browns won lately? They have any room to talk. I, the slander is just incredible. And I, for one, it gives me another excuse to say, let him hate. I cannot wait for the Broncos to shove it down everyone's throats this season and watch these same detractors try to weasel their way onto the bandwagon. And by then, there's no forgiving, no forgetting, and no vacancy. By the way, how am I coming through? Am I okay so hey, far? Good. Yeah. Okay. So far, so good. We're crossing our fingers. We paid our tithes to the football gods as your football <laughs> priests, and we're hoping that they they bless us here tonight. But yeah, unfortunately, normally I could pull up the story. I don't want to compromise the bandwidth on I this hotspot. Um, but if you want to pull it up, we can go through it uh, just really quick. Let me just make sure everybody understands what we're doing here. Again, gang, it's the Huddle Up podcast presented by Mile High Huddle couple of quick matters of business, and then we want to dive into today's topics. Make sure you're following the podcast on Twitter, at Huddle Up Pod. That's how you keep your finger on the pulse of what's happening with the show in real time. And while you're at it, you're going to want to make sure you also follow Mile High Huddle on Twitter. Super easy to do, as you can see here on the screen. And then, gang, just a really short call to action. If you're in a position, check out the merch store. It's another great way to support what we're doing. Get yourself one of these hats. Get yourself a Football Priest t-shirt. Little something for everybody out there, men, women. We're still working on getting some some kids stuff up there, but check that out if you're in a position. And if not, these three things right here are money. Any one of you can do these things. Make sure you're subscribed. Don't forget to like the video. And if you love what we're doing for you, share it out there. Those three things can really go a long way towards helping us out. All right, Zach. So real quick here, some some our great listeners are sh sending in the love, and I <laughs> don't want – while we're here, why don't you read this one in case I break yeah. up? Yeah, Mark uh, Langley drop it in 20 bucks. Thank you so much, Mark. It's good to see you. It's uh, good to have you on the pod tonight. He goes, thanks for mentioning me, guys, about coming on the show. Uh, that means a lot. My house is the same age as Garrett, and I said to myself, you got to be kidding me. That includes the used toilet bowls. You can't win for losing. Mark, to have you on here and to provide the laughs that you provide, the comic relief, it's invaluable. We appreciate your contributions, uh, you know, monetarily, but more so your interaction with us and the comments that you leave. I personally laugh. It's it's 
genuine laughter, what you inspired me to do. It's funny. Uh, it, it's good to have you around here. So it's good to see you. Thank you, Mark, again. Amen. Thank you, Mark. You keep us laughing. You keep us smiling. Levity is crucial, especially right. in a time like now where That's right. things, things outside the football world are a little topsy-turvy. So thanks for keeping it light. And yeah, we, uh, we had an interesting suggestion today, Zach, on social media, on Twitter. I think it was one of our great listeners and members of the community, Ryan Hamilton. And by the way, just interrupt me and let me know if I start tweaking out and being weird. You're good um, for now. Okay. But Ryan had a suggestion for the segment in which we invite on, like we did Christy last night on Sunday's pod, that we invite one of the Super Chat superstars and a <clears throat> you know big roller in the community, calling it, <clears throat> excuse me, um, what do you call it? Oh, orange colored glasses, something like that. So we definitely want to make it more of a staple of our show, Zach. And last night was just kind of the tip of the iceberg. And Mark, you're somebody we definitely would love to get on here one of these days and uh, pick your brain on how you became a Broncos fan. And, you know, we'll come up with like five questions for each and every superstar we bring on. I, I love that title personally, Chad. That's really cool. And, you know, we, like we said yesterday, we don't really have a set format or set list of candidates just yet, but it's something that we're going to explore. We definitely want to include more Broncos fans on the podcast. We want to start to give back to you guys because your support and your constant interaction with us has made the pod what it is today. And we're showing our appreciation. We're trying to, that's why we launched the merch store. It's why we try to take all your questions. It's why we try to interact with you on Twitter, through here, through everywhere, and also to bring you guys on. Whoever wants to do it, we'll start to make a list and start to, Chad, kind of see uh, the candidates kind of line up. And uh, if you're comfortable on camera, Mark, we'd love to eventually have you on. Yeah, it is a little bit different. And I think, you know, everybody's different depending on who you are and what your experience is. Speaking off the top of your head and in front of an audience, it can be a little bit aggravating and, you know, anxiety inducing for some people. But really, the thing to, to remember is when we do – start bringing more and more of the community onto the show for a little segment is everybody's among friends and it's just, it's just the community. It's, it's just mile high huddle. So keep that in mind, but Zach really quick here. Uh, by the way, guys, this is just another reminder. If it gets bad, I might have to just pop out and Zach will carry the torch and carry the, carry the load for tonight here. But I just want to quickly grab the super chats, Mike jumping in, uh, Appreciate you, my friend. Thank you, Mike. Every every stream, every chat, you're in here and you are showing your support, and we appreciate you. He says, dang, tech, thanks for fighting through it. We're trying, my friend. We are trying, and it has been – you want to talk about aggravating, man. I was in an extremely – I've been in an extremely bad mood for the last hour and change. Uh, James jumping in, Zach, he says here, appreciate you, my Thank friend. You, Big time effort community. I never really get these redrafts because the criteria they use is always so nebulous – and inconsistent. Yeah. Um, let's see, one of two. I don't know if he had another one, but Zach, if you wouldn't mind on your side, if you have it pulled up, <clears throat> let's just mm -hmm. tell everybody yeah. it was Jeff Legwald that did the draft redraft for the Broncos, and it was Drew Locke at pick 15. It was the same draft order as 2020. Drew Locke at 15. If you want to go through that, break it out for the for the community. Yeah, he, he stuck with his guns and took Drew Locke over the likes. You know, at the next pick at 16 was Matt uh, Matt Ryan, Atlanta. They, that was the same pick. 17, Dallas to Kyler Murray. Uh, 18, Pittsburgh, Teddy Bridgewater. 19, Chicago uh, was Jimmy Garoppolo. So I would honestly take Drew Locke over those quarterbacks. You might make the case that Matt Ryan is a better pro. Obviously, he is. He's more accomplished. But I think Drew Locke is younger. He has more upside in this offense. And he is the franchise quarterback, I think, that you want in Denver. I'm not really killing Legwald for making that selection, Chad. He's covering the Broncos. He has the pulse of the team. And we always talk about these national types not knowing what the Broncos are comprised of. This is exactly why. Everyone's looking at Locke at 15 thinking, oh, you took him too early. You took him too early. No, this is how the Broncos want it. They really are high on this quarterback and Legwald, unlike most of the national media, has the pulse of Denver. So I'm not throwing a hissy fit over it. I will take him over all those quarterbacks that I just mentioned, including Baker Mayfield, uh, 21 to Philadelphia, uh, Sam Darnold at New England at 23. I'll take Locke over all of them, Chad. Yeah. I mean, the strictures of this redraft, I think all 32 teams were allowed to pick, they had to pick a quarterback, a non quarterback offensive player. Uh, I, I don't have it right in front of me. And then a, a defensive player. And then the last one was like a wild card. And so Legwald took Locke at 15. I want to say it was Sutton in the fourth round. Or was it second round? I don't recall now off the top of my head. But his his three picks or four picks for the Broncos were 
Drew Locke, and this is picking all your the pool of players was only current NFL players. So Drew Locke, Cortland Sutton, Travis Kelsey drafted by Jeff Ladwell for the Broncos, and then Isaiah Simmons, Zach, for uh mm, love oh, that. It's it's glitching out on me. You're good. I'm gonna bounce out. I don't want to ruin the, I'm not I'm good. Yeah, I mean pretty solid See, right now. But it's back not on me, dude. I'm I'm just all right. Yeah, it's 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 doing its thing, guys. I'm sorry. Yeah, so uh, I'll be rocking solo for the rest of the pot. It looks like tonight, and you know, honestly, if you guys disagree or agree, let me know in the comments. Uh, James highlights it pretty well here. Drew Lock at 15, uh, Travis Kelsey at 50, and then Isaiah Simmons, and then Cortland Sutton. You put these players on the Broncos, and they're going to be an astronomically good team. And I would honestly make those selections in those spots. You're talking about the young franchise quarterback. You have the game-breaking best tight end in the NFL. You have obviously Cortland Sutton, who we all know and love by now, and you have Isaiah Simmons, who most Broncos fans wanted in the draft anyway. You're putting a three-position player in a Vic Fangio defense, and he would be amazingly good. Unfortunately, he's stuck with Vance Joseph in Arizona right now, uh, but in this redraft, in this scenario, he's landing in Denver. I happen to love the way Legwald made these picks. It's the same way I would go. It's the same kind of logic and thinking. I just don't understand the national slander against Drew Locke because he's not accomplished. He still, I believe he has more 300-yard passing games than Josh Allen does in 23 less career games. So you're talking about a young franchise quarterback who the Broncos scouted, who the Broncos traded up for, who the Broncos made arguably the face of their franchise going into 2020. I would honestly roll with it. I, don't even worry about the national media. This is what they do. They don't have the pulse of the team. Someone like Jeff Legwall does, and that's why he made that pick. I understand maybe over Matt Ryan, maybe that's the only argument you can make, but Drew Locke, honestly, um, is the right man for this uh, this uh, redraft. Uh, James uh, dropping uh, seven, seven euros, I believe. We appreciate that, James. He was Locke at 15, isn't egregious, but Stanley at number six, ridiculous. Matt Stafford plus Matt Ryan should be top 10. It's a quarterback league, pick one, or a great defender. You know what? Uh, it's Ronnie Stanley at number six to the Chargers. It is questionable. He went over Joey Bosa, Drew Brees, Dak Prescott, Nick Bosa, Wentz, Aaron Rodgers, Joe Burrow, and Tom Brady. He is, though, one of the best tackles in the NFL. He's going to be probably the highest paid tackle when he gets his extension. Ronnie Stanley is a good player, and it's really, really hard to find those uh, franchise tackles, as the Broncos could attest to. But this is exactly why, and I agree with you, James, I don't like these redrafts. It's just off-season fluff material because you can never go back. You can never play revisionist history in the NFL. And to do so, it, I think, is a giant waste of time. I don't understand the condemnation or the anger or just the constant tweeting and the group thing against Denver for making this selection. It's supposed to be a fun exercise because there's no way in hell in real life the Broncos are getting Drew Locke, Isaiah Simmons, Cortland Sutton, and Travis Kelsey. It's like a, a glorified fantasy football draft. So I don't understand why for the Broncos, they're drawing all this anger and every other team is drawing you know praise and it's lighthearted and it's fun. But that's also the national bias, not to bog down the podcast going against the national media, but this is also the bias the national media has against Denver. They take one look at the roster. They see Drew Locke only played in five games. He's young. He's unproven. Why is he over Sam Darnold? Why is he over Matt Ryan? Because he's the right man for the job. He is the right man for Denver. And Jeff Legwald, unlike his, the rest of his counterparts in national media, knows what he's talking about. So I happen to think it's it's fairly it's, – it's fair to make that selection. I, I just don't understand uh, the anger coming from it. But uh, Terry dropping in. Appreciate Terry up north showing that Broncos country is always a state of being. We appreciate you. He's dropping in the emojis that we can't really say on air, but everyone knows what they mean. George dropping in, uh, 20 bucks. Thank you so much, George. He goes, uh, missed last night. So the, so the delay tonight is worth the wait. We appreciate you. Uh, we, we missed you last night, George. We always love to see you around, but I understand if you have obligations, things going on. Happy to see you tonight. Appreciate your donation as always. And uh, let's get to, uh, let's take some of the questions before we move on to the second part of the Broncos podcast tonight, which is about Jarrell Casey. I'm sure some of you guys saw that. It's uh, interesting comments he made about the Titans sets up a nice week one grudge match. But let me know what you guys think. I'll take some in the comments here about these rankings, about Drew Locke going to Denver at 15, about this redraft. Uh, I happen to think it's kind of a waste of time, but by now I think you guys know what I think about that. Um, 
James, again, I, I mean, I, James, I'm pretty in tune with you. He goes, if the aim is to build a five-year Super Bowl window, lock is perfect. Rookie contract, unpaid production is key for that and easiest to get a quarterback. And that's why he's in Denver in real life, and that's why he's in Denver in this redraft, mock draft scenario. I, I don't I don't see what the anger is about, but uh, apparently other people do. So what else do we got here? Let's scroll through some of the comments. We uh, First of all, we uh, want to welcome all you guys. I see Poppy. Of course, Buana's in here. I see Rigo, Higher Learnings, Jody, Douglas, uh, Poppy dropping in. Uh, sorry about that, Buana. Put that up in one second. Uh, Poppy dropping in 20 bucks. Go Broncos. Thank you so much, Poppy. We appreciate you. Definitely a super, super chat superstar up on Mount Rushmore. Uh, we love to see you in here. We appreciate you tuning in. Uh, if Buana could you just put that last question back up. Sorry, I, uh, I cut that off. Okay, Charlie dropping in. Thanks, Buana. How about uh, Houston taking Hopkins again? Well, you know what? Even in a fantasy scenario, even in this redraft, Bill O'Brien is making Bill O'Brien type moves. Though, I mean, you can't really argue against it. I want to see where. He went 26 to Houston. They took him over Mike Evans, Matt Stafford, Tyreek Hill, Tua, George Kittle, and Stephon Gilmore. It's interesting. DeAndre Hopkins is obviously a top three, maybe, you know, best overall receiver in the NFL, but that's that's questionable considering Mike Evans is up there. Matt Stafford's a franchise quarterback. Tyreek Kill's Tyreek Kill. George Kittle's the best tight end in football or the second best tight end. Stephon Gilmore's a shutdown cornerback. That's just uh, Houston, though. That's just Bill O'Brien. Uh, what else we got here? Let's, uh, someone asked where Bowles went. Yeah. Bowles wasn't, uh, on this. I didn't see where he went in all four rounds. It was a four round redraft. I didn't see where he went, but, uh, I don't anticipate it being that high up. Uh, so yeah, Jody, I hate to, uh, spoil that question for you. Uh, what else? Anyone have any other comments about the redraft scenario for Denver? I'd love to hear it from you. This is where, you know, Chad and I would banter back and forth, but we have to kind of make do with what we have right now. Um, yeah, James drop it. I was going to get that question in fairness, not really a question in fairness. Washington took Trent Williams again, got to undo those GM mistakes. LOL. Yeah. I, I, for these reporters covering the team, I think, you know, in terms of the Houston reporter, in terms of the Washington reporter, they kind of go with the players they're familiar with. That's why Legwald went with Drew Locke. It's just what you know. You know what's best for the team. You have the pulse of the team. And in this scenario, even though you can pick anyone or most people, the pool is opening up, you still know in realistic terms what would be best for the team. So it's part of the reason, too, why I don't understand these redrafts. I'm not getting upset over it. I just don't understand the point of them. If it wasn't a unique offseason with no practices, if it wasn't with everything going on, I don't think this would be published right now. But, you know, what are you going to do? Uh, Chris dropping in, $21 donation. Thank you so much, Chris. He says, keep up the great work. Cheers. Click those little thumbs up. Yeah, another call to action for you guys. If you want, please, please, if you can't subscribe, if you can't uh, cop any merch, please just click the like button, share this podcast out, share this video out, re help us reach a bigger audience, help us grow. We just reached 7K. We're not stopping there, though. We want to hit 10K, 15K, 20K, 50K, 100K. We want to take over YouTube and become not only the best Broncos podcast, but the best football NFL podcast out there. So if you can hit the thumbs up, like he said, if you can share this podcast out, it is greatly appreciated. All right, so I think that pretty much covers uh, the redraft scenario with Drew Lock at 15. If you guys want to check that out, it's at mylihuddle.com. The article is up with the uh, full breakdown of the picks. David dropping in, uh, 999 donation. Thank you so much, David. We appreciate you. He goes, can you guys please add a jacket to the merch store? Sorry, I have missed the pod. The last couple of pods ended up having a family issues. I'm sorry to hear that, David. That's obviously more important. That takes precedent. We love to see you here. We're happy to have you here now. We will definitely look to add a jacket. I don't know how popular that would be, though, considering it's going into summer and it's getting really hot everywhere around the country. We can look into that for sure. We definitely want to add some kids merchandise, um, some things for the family and this and that. We want to keep it going, but we can look into a jacket for sure. So we appreciate your feedback. Now, in terms of, let me just take a breath. In terms of Jarrell Casey, he had an interview today. I believe it was a, a local interview. It was on the Double Coverage podcast with Devin and Jason McCourty. And he made a really interesting comment. This is I'm going to read the full quote. I'm going to get into what I feel about this because it's it sets up a, a wild week one revenge game matchup. 
He was asked about the trade that sent him, obviously, from the Titans to the Broncos this offseason. He was traded for a seventh-round pick. It was a steal for Denver. I happen to think it's the best move of the offseason in the entire NFL, definitely one of them, that you'll never get to steal a five-time Pro Bowler for a seventh-round pick. But this is what he said, quote, the part that is so crazy is that you give so much to them, especially when you come up on free agency and have opportunities to go somewhere else, especially the way it was going when we were there, 2-14, and 3-13. and 13. Those were some rough times. When you're a loyal guy and you feel like things are going in the right direction and you're that centerpiece, you got no choice but to fight it through. My mindset was to stick it out and things would get better. For us to get to that point to get better and to be a main focus of that and then you just throw me away to the trash like I wasn't a main block of that. Coming off an injury the year before and playing the whole season for y'all. No complaints. I did everything you wanted me to do, and you throw me like a piece of trash. At the end of the day, none of these businesses are loyal. At, those are very, very, very strong words from Jarrell Casey, and he's absolutely right, not only in how he feels, traded away, discarded for a seventh-round pick, unceremoniously dumped after all he's done for Tennessee, five Pro Bowls, countless plays, countless sacks, countless you know uh, uh, winning opportunities to help the team become from a, a losing team last year to a team that became w- really close to making the Super Bowl, be discarded like that. But the bigger point here is that the NFL is a business. It's a business first and foremost that's lost on a lot of people, a lot of idealistic people that are living in dream worlds that don't realize it's a multi-billion dollar business. And sometimes you make tough business decisions. It's not always fair. It's not always right. But that's also how life is. Rarely are things fair. Rarely are things the way it deserves to be. You don't really get your just desserts that way. And Jarrell Casey didn't get his. But he's right, though. He was thrown away for a seventh-round draft pick. He was traded to, I think, a, a better team that can that can utilize his skill set and his talent. But he feels like what he put in in Tennessee was deserving, not, not to be traded away, but maybe for a higher-round draft pick, maybe not to be traded away at all, maybe to get a second contract. But that's the way the NFL goes. And uh, I don't blame him. I mean, I, I don't blame him at all to, to, for being mad. But I hope what it does is this. He's going to harness this energy, and it puts a chip on his shoulder, I think, that hasn't been there. This is an accomplished veteran pass rusher, defensive tackle who's been around the game a long time. He's seen a lot of things. He's accomplished a lot. He's never really had to have a chip on his shoulder the size of now. What that does, not only for week one, Broncos, Titans, Monday Night Football, prime time. You're going to tell me this isn't the perfect grudge match. This isn't the perfect revenge game for Jarrell Casey. It's one of those situations where you can see a fourth quarter, games tied 17, three minutes ago, he sacks Ryan Tannehill's strap, uh, sack fumble, the Broncos recover, kick a game-winning field goal, he can become the hero. It's setting up to be that way. But what he's going to prove to the Titans in front of a national audience, in front of his old teammates and coaches that I'm not a piece of trash, I deserve to be there with you guys still, but now that I'm not, I'm going to make you regret it every single snap along the way. Every single down, I'm on the field. I'm going to show you why I am not a piece of trash. I'm going to show you why I'm deserving of being compensated or traded if you had to trade me for more than a seventh-round draft pick. He was one of my favorite pickups of the offseason, but to show this much passion and come out and be this forthright and be this honest, I love to hear it. I I would hate the platitudes. I would hate the same old cliches like, you know, I enjoy my time there and it's, it's, it's time to move on. It's the Broncos. I'm excited to be here. No, he's holding a major grudge. It's not going to make only him better. It's going to make the Broncos better overall. So I'm really happy to see it. I, I love the passion. I love the fire and it's, kind of lends to that that credence of the Broncos being this discarded underdog type team, the counted out type team, the bulletin board team that improve every single person, including the Titans, including these national media types, including every team in the NFL, wrong. Come January when they're on the playoffs and they're making noise like the Titans did last year, he can attest to that. He's going to prove everyone wrong. The Broncos are going to prove everyone wrong. And they're all going to come groveling back to Denver, trying to get on the bandwagon too late. No vacancy, no occupancy. You're done. And I can't wait to see it. So that's how I feel about that. Glenn, drop in 499. We appreciate you, Glenn, as always. Good to see you. 
A light contribution towards Chad data plan after tonight. <laughs> Thanks. As always, fellas, hashtag state of being, hashtag our team is stacked, hashtag MHH, hashtag it remains nameless. Yeah, Glenn, I love the hashtags there. And hopefully, Chad, if you can hear me right now, you can put that toward your, <laughs> like he said, your data plan. I know it's frustrating. I see you in the green room. Uh, we'll get it fixed. Uh, Wednesday, we'll have no problem. And uh, Glenn, we appreciate you as always. But I want to hear, before I, I hop in, I'm going to open it up. It's kind of an impromptu Broncos pod tonight. It's not how we wanted to do it. We had a 7K special. We had my top moments, Chad's top moments. But we're going to make it kind of an impromptu mailbag. So whatever you guys want to know, what you guys think about the redraft, about Drew Locke, about Drew Casey, fire in those comments. I'll get to as many as I can. We're at 25 minutes. We have some time tonight. Let me know. Uh, but I'm going to just scroll through the comments here and see what you guys have to say. What else? What do we got? Thank you, Buana. Uh, Robert says, Titans dumped him. We will suffer for it. Uh, if the, if this, I don't know if the Broncos will suffer for it, but I think the uh, the Titans will suffer for it. This was a major, major pickup for the Broncos. You're talking about, again, a five-time Pro Bowler who can play all over the defensive line, who can get after the quarterback, who can stop the run. This is the missing piece that the Broncos have needed for years now. They've always had a top-flight secondary. They've always had good pass rushers, but they whiffed on Adam Gotsis. They whiffed on Demarcus Walker for the most part. Draymond Jones is an unknown. Shelby Harris came on, but Derek, Derek Wolf's gone. He was over the hill. They never really had – Sylvester Williams, even going back to him, he was a bust for the most part. You, they never really had – that interior pocket pusher who can make plays and, and change the course of the game in the middle of the defense. Now you have that with Jarrell Casey, and you put him in the middle of Von Miller and Bradley Chubb, and flanking them behind them is Justin Simmons, is AJ Boye, is, is Kareem Jackson. It's really exciting to see he, that he's the missing piece, and they finally have that uh, that long, long needed a guy in the middle of the defense. So the Broncos aren't going to suffer. The Titans will suffer starting in Week One. They're going to make. Uh, they're going to feel bad, I think, for treating him, like he said, a piece of trash. Let me just uh, take my old Facebook Lives. Everyone, anyone who's tuned in with me on Facebook Live back in the day, you know I get a little animated when I'm by myself. So uh, it's, it's a nice little throwback. Charlie dropping in. He says it's all about the bottom line. It is, and that's that's how it is in life. That's how it is in business. It's how it is in the NFL. It's just what's so. It's not what you deserve. It's not what's coming to you. It's not what's right. It's not what's fair. Uh, life, the NFL, business, it's all gray. Things are rarely black and white. Things are, are constantly fluid, constantly changing. And you either adapt or you die. And I think Jarrell Casey will adapt. He's certainly not going to die. The Titans, they're going to adapt to his departure. But they made a business decision getting rid of him for a seventh round pick. Unloading his contract. Freeing up some cap space, making room for new blood. They have Jeffrey Simmons there who's going to be a good player, but he's not Jarrell Casey. It is all about the bottom line, but the Broncos won this bottom line, and they're going to see, everyone's going to see come September. Uh, Terry dropping in, another $2 donation. Appreciate you, Terry. He says, Casey, major upgrade over Wolf, hashtag state of being. Exactly. I, I mean, not only at the five technique position, but the three technique position, you put him next to Mike Purcell, you put him opposite Shelby Harris, you put him with... Um, Draymond Jones on this defensive line. And again, you have him rush in the middle. You have him collapse the pocket. And then you have around the outsides, you have Bradley Chubb and Von Miller, a healthy Bradley Chubb, a reinvigorated Von Miller. What do you do? Where do you go? You can't step up. You can't go to the outside. The, the secondary is going to smother your wide receivers. It's going to be really fun to watch. That's why I love this pickup. And John Elway, he's made a lot of nice, shrewd business decisions and nice, shrewd trades over the course of his GM tenure with the Broncos. This is right up there with being among the best. A seventh-round pick for a five-time Pro Bowler is more than a steal. It is highway robbery, and I cannot wait to see it pay dividends for Denver this season and beyond. What else do we got here? Let's go through some of the comments. Here's a good question. Sorry, Buana. Let me put that back in one second. Jess, uh, Jess C013 Sports. That's a new name I haven't seen. We appreciate you. Welcome to the podcast. Uh, he, she wants to know, does AJ Johnson have a better season this upcoming season? He will be getting first team reps from the jump. Yeah, I mean, he that, that's a no-brainer. He was locked into a starting role, and he proved that he can be and should be the starting linebacker for Denver opposite Todd Davis. I think... You know, obviously, 
it's it remains to be seen whether it was a flash in the pan. It remains to be seen whether it was an outlier. I don't think it is. This is the reason why the Broncos gave him so much money when his whole rape case was cleared. This is the reason why he was so highly touted at Tennessee. He was going to be a high-round draft pick. He had a great future in front of him, and unfortunately he had some off-field business happen, and that kind of derailed his career temporarily. But he proved last year, again, what's the one thing the Broncos were missing all these years aside from having a guy in the middle of the defense that can push the pocket? An athletic, three-down, inside linebacker. Todd Davis wasn't it. Brennan Marshall was kind of it for a few years, but kind of not really. Uh, Josie Jewell never really panned out. He was more of a run stuffer, but A.J. Johnson can be that guy. He is a three-down player. He's athletic. He's good in pass coverage. He makes plays. He's good in run support. It was so refreshing last year to watch a Broncos inside linebacker be around the football and pass coverage, not trailing a tight end 20 yards down the field like the Darren Waller was tearing Todd Davis up over the years and all the other tight ends in the AFC West. A.J. Johnson was hanging step for step with tight ends. He was recording pass breakups, interceptions. He was stuffing the run. He's a very dynamic player. Todd Davis... Starting for now opposite him, but when you have Justin Stern out on the roster, who's going to start, I believe, no later, if he stays healthy, then by week 12, week 13, he will supplant Todd Davis. The Broncos will have one of the best inside linebacker duos in the entire NFL. Justin Stern at A.J. Johnson. That's exciting because they haven't had that for a while. And it just, again... You talk about one of the best inside linebacker tandems, one of the best outside linebacker tandems, one of the best secondaries. Now you have Gerald Casey, one of the best defensive lines. What is the weakness with this Broncos defense? On paper, I do not see one. If they play to potential, this is a top five, maybe even top three, top two defense. I cannot wait to see AJ. I don't think he'll disappoint. I think he'll rebound and be even better than he was last season. Uh... Uh, Terry dropping in again, $2 donation, hashtag solo Zach, killing it. We appreciate that, Terry. Thank you. I'm trying. It's not easy as Shaq can attest. You know, I, I love bantering with him back and forth. I think him and I have really good chemistry. We, we play off each other really well. It, it's not easy to rock this solo. It, it's it, You lose a whole different connection and uh and segment to the show, but I'm going to try my best. Hopefully you guys are, are appreciating it. Hope you guys are having fun with me here and uh, we'll keep it going for a little while, a little while longer. Uh, Mark from Facebook, he's jumping in. He wants to know, is it really that hard to find a decent middle linebacker? It's not easy. I, I mean, for a while, the Niners had Patrick Willis, Navarro Bowman. Those guys, you know, for one reason or another, they kind of, their careers are over now. And, and it's, you always were looking for that dynamic player. That's why they were so highly touted in those years under the, under Jim Harbaugh in that era, because they were so dy dynamic. They didn't have just one great inside linebacker. They had two. They're not easy to find. It's you know you talk about Ray Lewis, you talk about all these other dynamic young inside linebackers. The Broncos didn't have one for a while. I know Brandon Marshall was a big, not a big, I wouldn't say a big fan favor, but he was pretty serviceable for a couple of years. He, he was a pretty decent linebacker, but Todd Davis was always at Achilles' heel. Todd Davis was always preventing the Broncos from being a truly, truly, truly elite defense beyond 2015. It's not easy. It, it's it's not it's easier than finding a, a franchise quarterback or franchise left tackle, shut down cornerback, but inside linebacker, not a lot of Luke Keekley's out there. And that's why when he retires, he walks away when he did. It's such a big blow to the NFL. Same with Patrick Willis and Navarro Bowman. They're very tough to find. Usually they're either good at one or the other. They could be pass coverage specialists or run stuffers. It's rare to find a guy who could do both. And that's why AJ Johnson, the Broncos lucked out with getting him on the roster. Oh, Jess is a dude. Appreciate the end, and I uh, appreciate the clarification. Sorry about that. I'm a dude, and I changed my name. I followed you guys for a while since your 24-7 Facebook days. Appreciate you, Jess. It's good to see you. I don't recognize you uh, from your old username, but like I said, I've been doing these Facebook Lives. I, I rocked them solo back in the day, so it's uh, it's kind of a throwback to do it uh, tonight. So I appreciate you tuning in. Uh, no, Andrew wants to know, did Chad die of the issue that shall go unnamed? No, he did not. He is, uh, he's dealing with an internet issue tonight. He had a, uh, an outage in his area. So he's just going to kind of sit out tonight. He's monitoring, he's, he's watching and he's, uh, he's tuning in and seeing everything. Uh, Robert jumping in Robert kitchens. We appreciate your comment. He goes, Zach, does Locke will pick up Shermer's system right away? Or do you think it will take a whole season to pick up? It's a good question. I 
I'm a big Drew Locke fan. I don't want to spout over the top optimism. I don't want to just, you know, spout nothing but, you know, you know, sunshine and, and ponies and rainbows. It could be an acclimation process, especially with a unique offseason, no OTAs, no minicamp, nothing really until training camp. And that's going to be weird with no fans. And he has a lot of new playmakers around him, a new offense. It could be a transition. I'm not going to say he's going to come out and throw for 500 yards, five touchdowns every game. That being said, though, you're talking about a guy who dealt with constant turnover at Missouri, constant turnover. Changing coordinators like they change underwear over there. And he dealt with it. He rolled with the punches. He, he got himself to be an elite quarterback prospect, and he was a second-round pick in the NFL draft. This is one guy I'm not worried about. If this was Josh Rosen or, or Daniel Jones or Sam Darnold, I, I have more apprehension. But Drew Locke has such mental fortitude, not just physical talent, but mental fortitude, mental ability to overcome this. He is a natural-born leader. He is a natural-born quarterback. And I think the Broncos see his franchise tendencies come out on the field and off the field. They hired a guy in Pat Shermer. I mean, you could do a lot worse if you're going to change coordinators than get a guy who has a noted quarterback history of developing guys and bringing them along, turning them into really, really good passers. So he's in good hands. You have Mike Shula, you have Pat Shermer, you have the talent around Drew Locke to succeed. I am not uh, worried at all about the transition. If there's any glitches in the beginning, that will be cleared up by midseason at the latest, and the Broncos will go on, I think, to have a good season. So don't worry about Drew Locke. Uh, Darian P wants to know, I hope, or, or just commenting, I, I hope Locke performs this season like Zach is tonight. That means Locke is winning MVP and Super Bowl MVP. That's awesome, Darian. I, I definitely appreciate that. You know, I wouldn't call myself Super Bowl MVP. I'm just kind of pinch hitting right now, kind of, you know, flying solo and, and doing my part here, but I do appreciate that sentiment. Uh, Glenn says, aside from left tackle, is there anything that scares you about this team? You guys know how I feel about left tackle. Uh, Garrett Bowles, I, I don't really think he's going to be this all-world left tackle that some Broncos fans think with Mike Munchak in his second season. If he can be just good, if he can be just consistent and average and just stable, I, I think he will be an asset to this team. But right tackle scares me as well. I'm not going to lie. I mean, Juwan James, he's good on paper. He, he He's good. He was good in Miami for when he was on the field. He got a big contract for a reason. But this is a guy who would miss a game due to a hangnail. This is a guy who's so mentally soft that after signing with the Broncos, a report came out that the Dolphins were laughing at Denver for handing him $51 million. They called him a whoopee cushion. That scares me. Having a whoopee cushion, quote unquote, protect your franchise quarterback. I'm not. Uh, and then what makes matters worse is that the only guy beneath Garrett Bowles and Juwan James is Elijah Wilkinson, who's not a natural tackle and coming off a foot injury and surgery. That scares me. So tackle both spots scare me. Cornerback depth scares me in the sense that Boye, he's good, but he's it remains to be seen if he can get back to that Pro Bowl level like he was a couple seasons ago. And then underneath them, you have Bosby coming off an injury. Callahan, is he even a real person? He's coming back from an injury. You have the rookie, Oja Mudia. Is he going to pan out? Is he going to be the opposite of Langley and Isaac Yadam? You have Yadam. A lot of question marks at cornerback. So I'm going to say, aside from tackle, cornerback kind of scares me as well. But other than that, the Broncos are really, really solid on paper. And to give Elway credit, they improved wholly over the roster this offseason. So cornerback and tackle are the spots that scare me the most. All right. Big, let me just take a sip real quick. Good old Gatorade. Uh, big body boy. Appreciate you uh, joining us tonight. He says, one thing I wish, though, what we found some room for Byron Jones, whether it be not signing Melvin Gordon or cutting Hireman. Listen, uh, Byron Jones got a, a huge deal. He got a market resetting contract, and the Broncos were never, never, ever, ever approaching that. And I don't really blame them. I mean, this is a guy who hasn't recorded an interception in two seasons now. He, he's not a playmaking cornerback. He was hyped up in Dallas because in Dallas, most, most players get that, that Cowboys bump, that Cowboys lore for whatever reason. He was a good, I wouldn't necessarily say he was a great cornerback. The Broncos were smart to be saving some of their money. And you know what? As a consolation prize, they traded a fourth round pick for AJ Boye, who comes cheaper and he's more of a playmaker and more of a fit in the Vic Fangio system than Byron Jones was. I agree with you though, Melvin Gordon, they overpaid for him. I agree with you. The cutting Hireman should have been done yesterday. I don't know why he's still on the roster, but I think the Broncos made a wise move 
uh, not to go after Byron Jones. Uh, Poppy dropping in $22. That's awesome, Poppy. Thank you so much for your contributions. He goes, thank you, Zach, for all you do. MHH family, really appreciate you and Chad. Thank you again, Go Broncos. Thank you so much, Poppy. You've really become a uh, superstar, bona fide Mount Rushmore uh, for Super Chat. We definitely appreciate you. Thank you so much. What else we got? Chris, he goes, with our solid interior OL forming the pocket for lock, the tackles should be able to show rushers outside, should be able to show rushers outside and mitigate some major concerns at tackle. It's one area where I think the Broncos really improved a lot, obviously, was the interior O-line. You have Glasgow, who they signed. Obviously, you have Dalton Reiser, who's going to be a perennial pro bowler, if not all pro. And having Reiser next to Bowles, that's going to be a boon for him. And you have Glasgow, who was really a solid, if unheralded, starter in Detroit for many years, next to Juwan James. It's a great point that you made. And also, those two guards are sandwiching Lloyd Cushenberry at center. You can do a lot worse than having those three players in your interior, and they're going to be the strength of this offensive line. And that's why if Garrett Bowles can just get his act together and Juwan James can just stay healthy and, and be mentally tough, the Broncos' offensive line, it's its funny to say, they can be top 10 material. I, I said it last year. It didn't really work out that way, but they can be top 10 if all things go according to plan. And that would only obviously benefit Drew Locke and the Broncos' offense. What else? <laughs> Glenn dropping in 499 for Zach's book fund. You know, I got, I'm starting to build it up a little bit. I, I don't really have a lot of books up there yet, but I have a, a little horse thing I got. It looks kind of resembled like a Bronco to me. So I put it up there. I, I'm starting to build it up, Glenn, and everybody else asking. So I uh, appreciate you noticing. David Kilgore dropping in 499. Thank you so much, David. Uh, bonafide super chat superstar. We appreciate you every time you tune in with us. He goes, Are you concerned about the lack of experience we have in our secondary? Hate to have upgraded everywhere else, and we suck in uh, pass defense. It's a good question. Uh, you know, I just talked about cornerback. You talk about safety as well. Behind Kareem Jackson and Justin Simmons, you have who? Trey Marshall and Douglas Coleman. Those two players aren't proven. You lost Will Parks. You didn't replace them with a, uh, a veteran player. So it, it's fair to say that the secondary depth is a little concerning, more so at cornerback for me. And that's only because they did not add another veteran. I still think they should have signed Prince of Mukamara. They should have signed someone to go along with A.J. Boye. But, you know, they, they're high on Michael Lowe. They're high on, on Bosby coming back. They think they can salvage um, uh, Isaac Adam. They have, you know, they have some players in that secondary who can perform, especially at corner. But I would have liked one more veteran at safety or corner to kind of alleviate my concerns. Uh, Jess, again, uh, he asked, did we get a new punter? I think it's funny that Pat McAfee has Tom McMahon's son as his intern. Yeah, they did get a new punter. They they signed Sam Martin from Detroit, who's solid, if unspectacular. I, I, he's not going to be Ray Guy 2.0, but they don't really need that. They just need someone who's not going to shank punts. They need someone who's going to flip the field when the Broncos do punt and not put the defense in precarious situations. I, I like the pickup a lot. It was kind of an under-the-radar move that's going to help the Broncos out. But like I said before, as long as Tom McMahon is running the special teams unit, I'm going to have my concerns. I, I don't think he's a coordinator that's cut out to be a coordinator at this level. I don't think he's the coordinator for the Broncos. He's not that much better to me than Brock Olivo was. He just – he's – it's way too inconsistent. He hung with Colby Wadman for way too long. Marquette King blamed the Broncos and Tom McMahon for ruining his technique and ruining his career. It just been hasn't a good tenure. It's not been a good tenure for Tom McMahon. But hopefully Sam Martin will, will stabilize that position. Brandon McManus goes back to being Brandon McMoney, and the Broncos have a better special teams unit that makes McMahon look better by default. Uh, Oscar dropping in 299, hashtag Chad's internet fund. Chad, we're going to, it's, you got a new hashtag just like Nick's beer fund. So we have a, a couple things going on the MHH landscape. Appreciate you, Oscar. What else? A liberal hater dropping in 10 bucks. Appreciate you. Thank you so much. He asks, why is almost no one even seeing how much the Broncos improved this offseason? Smaller market. I wouldn't say it's a market because you're talking about maybe teams like Tampa Bay who were really, really minuscule markets and they're getting all this praise. Obviously they, you know, they signed Tom Brady. They have Gronkowski. Now it's not in market size. It's disrespect 
from a national standpoint. You've seen it years and years and years and years now. It's the same reason why there's so many Hall of Fame snubs. Ron Smith, Mecklenburg, Gratishar. That's not a market problem. That's a Broncos bias problem. This is the national media not knowing what they're talking about. It's the same reason today everyone was up in arms that Drew Locke went 15 in a redraft. It's a redraft. It's an it's a fa- glorified fantasy draft done for fun and fluff in the dead of the offseason. But a lot of national media types took issue with that because the Broncos took a quarterback at, at 15 uh, over some other players. It's just a bias. It's not my perception. It's not Chad's perception. It's not... Anyone's perception, it's reality. It's facts. There's a bias against Denver. It's been around for years now. And that's why, despite getting Jarrell Casey for a seventh-round draft pick, despite getting, you know, Jerry Judy and KJ Hamler having a great draft, despite getting AJ Boye for a fourth-round pick, they're not getting the proper praise they deserve. But you know what? Like I always say, let them hate. Let them keep hating. Let them keep giving the Broncos bulletin board material. Let them keep counting them out as underdogs. They thrive off that. That is how they win. That is how they will themselves to a title in 2015, by being counted out and being disrespected. They will all see, come January and beyond, this is not a joke. This is a team that's going to be around and be a contender for a long time. Jason O'Neill dropping in. He wants to know, will the, pl- the plethora of targets that Denver now possesses, do you think that Denver will continue to be predictable or no? All comes down to coaching. I said it last year. I said it the year before. I'll say it again. It all comes down to coaching. That's what makes or breaks an NFL team is coaching. You can have a, the best roster in the world. If you have a crappy coach like Vance Joseph, you're not going to get anywhere. That being said, though, predictability it's it's play calling. It's scheming. It's it's calling the right place at the right time. It's up to Pat Shermer. We want to talk about Drew Locke taking that next step. Pat Shermer has to put him in positions where he's going to succeed. And not just Drew Locke as well, but using Melvin Gordon correctly, using Philip Lindsay correctly, scheming around the deficiencies around Garrett Bowles and Juwan James. All comes down to coaching. Predictable, though, that's the one thing in terms of being vanilla I don't see for Denver this year. Maybe last year with Sangarello, maybe the year before with Musgrave and the year before that with McCoy. Not this year. They're going to be aggressive. They're going to be challenging defenses vertically, not horizontally. They're going to take shots down the field. It could result in turnovers. It could have you scratching your head sometimes as to why the Broncos were overly aggressive, why they took a shot here. But the one thing I don't think they're going to be is predictable. What else? Let me scroll through some of the questions. And again, guys, this is a pretty much an impromptu from this point on. We have about, I would say, about 15 more minutes to go. Anything you guys want to know, but, but we're going to make it an impromptu mailbag tonight. So get your questions in if you have any. I'll try to get to them. Jody wants to know, thoughts on Sutton and Patrick outside and Judy in the slot. This is, again, it goes back to what I was saying in my last question. All comes down to coaching. You can move those players anywhere around the formation. That's the beauty of having these players on the roster. Maybe not Sutton. I, I think he's more of a strict outside guy. Tim Patrick, though, he can play the slot. Deshaun Hamilton can play the slot and outside. Jerry Judy can play the slot or outside. KJ Hamler can play the slot. You can even bounce them around the backfield. You can do a, a multitude of things with the players they have. All comes down to coaching, though. I mean, I even see a comment that Terry just said. I'm not going to highlight it, but Terry said, Noah Fant jet sweep. And I know that's a throwback to Scangarello. He ran way too many of those last year. But they have so many dynamic players from tight end to running back to receiver, they can do so many different things. And that's why the one thing I don't they're going to not be this year is predictable. But you can move them around. It all comes down to coaching, though. If Pat Shermer calls the right plays and draws up the right plays, this will be a very fun offense to watch, the likes of which we have not seen since 2013 in Peyton Manning. What else? Uh, Gary Palmer dropping in with five bucks. Appreciate you, Gary. He says, thanks for hanging in, Chad. Broncos are for real, and I love that we are underrated. So do I. That's why I keep saying, hashtag let them hate. They will all see, come January and beyond, this is a real deal Broncos football team. This isn't the Vance Joseph, Case Keenum-led Broncos. This isn't Paxton Lynch. This is a real deal Denver team that has the right coaching, the right personnel, and more importantly, the right mindset, the right culture to win. They're doing it the right way, building from the ground up. Let them hate. Let them be counted out. Let the Nick Wrights of the world predict 3-13. and 13. They have no idea what they're talking about. He'll be apologizing in February like Adam Rank did this past offseason. Let them hate. 
encourage the hate, support the hate. Don't get mad. Don't push back against it. Don't question it. Embrace the hate. I am telling you now, it's how the Broncos succeed and it's how they thrive. Uh, Geo dropping in, George, we appreciate you dropping 10 bucks. Thanks as always. He says, it's so great to see your enthusiasm of this year as, as I have. I am pumped about the Broncos this season. And you know what? I, I've always been kind of enthusiastic about Denver. I, it's just a team that I've grown to be very invested in for, for four years now. But this is a new Broncos team. This is a new era in Broncos football. Not just because you have Drew Locke, not just because of Vic Fangio, but even the way the Broncos are drafting, even the way the Broncos are acquiring talent, getting Jarrell Casey for a seventh round draft pick. Last year, getting your franchise quarterback at number 42 overall after securing your perennial Pro Bowl left guard of the future. I just love the way the Broncos are operating and we, we trash Elway in the past. We all said it, it falls at his feet to criticism, and it absolutely does. It starts with Elway, but the same token can apply to praise. It starts with Elway. He has changed the way he has run this team. He has assembled talent. He has assembled coaching. He has been the catalyst of change for Denver, and that's why I'm so excited to see what they can do when they put it all together in 2020 and beyond. Uh, Kevin, good to see you. Drop it in. Five bucks. Appreciate you. Uh, give a shout-out to my girl, Susan Zach, first time watcher. I don't know. <laughs> I'm kind of scared. I don't know if that's a troll comment. I don't know if that's a if that's a joke. But uh, Susan Zach, I don't know. I don't know. Appreciate you if you're watching. If that's a real person, but uh, thanks, Kevin. Austin dropping in four ninety nine. Thank you, Austin. We appreciate that. Thoughts on Judy and Locke? I'm loving that Judy is doing his best to gain that chemistry with his new quarterback. I love it. I, I mean, you can say what you want about them being pros and them being drafted, but Judy was under no obligation to come to Denver when he did. Not with everything going on, not with these these protests and these riots and the issue that shall go unnamed. He really could have stayed where he was and kicked back and, and come to Denver for training camp. But that's the beauty of having a franchise quarterback. That's the pull and that's the allure of having a franchise quarterback like Drew Locke because everyone wants to gravitate around him on the field and off the field. And you're seeing KJ Hamler's in Denver, Jerry Judy's in Denver, uh, Locke is organizing throwing sessions with Philip Lindsay and Sutton and, and, and the rest of his receivers. It's so exciting to watch. This is what I'm talking about, the new era of Broncos football, because where was this with Paxton Lynch? He was playing video games. Where was this with Case Keenum? He was, you know, doing whatever. You didn't have this in the past. Now you have it. And you're reaping the rewards of a young, hotshot, alpha, confident, swaggerous franchise quarterback. Love to see it. They're going to be uh, instant, instant chemistry, instant connections starting in week one. What else? What else, Buana? What else we got? We have a few more minutes here. Uh, okay. Glenn, Zach, when you and Chad met up at the 2019 NFL Scouting Combine, what was your most indelible moment besides Chad breaking wind in his sleep? For reals, though, top moment, the, the John Lynch response, P. Carroll, Drew Locke, Dalton Rice. That's a great question. We appreciate your uh, your query there. You know, it's funny that you say that. I, I wouldn't say that Chad broke wind in his sleep, but we did have to share a, a really tiny room. I was sleeping on the floor on the top of my backpack. It was just uh, not the best logistical uh, set up for, for Indianapolis, but I had the time of my life there. I, I, uh, I accorded to being a Toys R Us for grownups who love the NFL. you you walk around, you're surrounded by the Schefters and the Rappaports and, and coaches and GMs and executives. Chad and I were walking behind Chris Cooper and, uh, it was, it was crazy to see the, the collection, the talent there and the collection of personalities there. My favorite moment, I love, you know, I love that you know that the, the John Lynch thing and the, the Pete Carroll thing, I asked him questions. I ruffled Pete Carroll's feathers. For anyone who doesn't know, I'll tell the story real quick. I asked him, why, point blank, why did you sign Pax and Lynch? What did you really see in him that warranted him getting getting a contract from Seattle? And and Pete Carroll got kind of defensive with me. He kind of took umbrage to that question. He, he said he's... I think he said he was tall, as a matter of fact. He actually went to that well and said, he's, he's this and that. I didn't really buy it. It sounded like coach speak to me. I asked John Lynch about the number two overall pick if he's interested in trading. He actually said back to me, why, are you interested? And I said, no, the Broncos might be, though. So he's a great guy. He's a very, uh, very good sport. I loved interacting with him. My personal favorite moment, though, like you hit on, was talking to Dalton Reisner. As soon as I got up to the podium, there was a group of people surrounding him. He was a very, very uh, popular prospect at that time, one of the top guards in the entire NFL draft. And he was so humble, and he was so appreciative of being there, and he was so 
nice outwardly to everyone around him. I've told the story before, but there was a reporter who was behind the podium. He, he couldn't even see Dalton Reiser and Dalton Reiser couldn't see him. And he's and Dalton Reiser stopped someone else from answering a question or asking a question and said, no, let me take this guy. He, he's been waiting. He's been patient. Let me get to him. You don't see that type of humility. You don't see that type of, of, of kindness from a guy who's going to be a multimillionaire in the NFL in just a few short months. And not only that, when I asked Dalton Reiser about playing for the Broncos, his face immediately lit up. He was so excited for the prospect of staying home and starring for his home state team and, 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 uh, and, and blocking for the Broncos running backs and for the Broncos quarterbacks. I knew right away. This was the guy the Broncos had to have. I was screaming and pounding the table from that point forward. You have to take this guy. He was one of my favorite Broncos draft picks, probably top three of the John Elway era, and he was my favorite part of that scouting combine. Uh, Blake dropping in $2. Thank you, Blake. We appreciate that. It's not much. Just wanted to help go Broncos. Blake, you didn't even have to do that. Any contribution, we definitely appreciate. But just, and we say it a lot, just your guys' interaction. Just going back and forth with us, just just conversing with us and, and shooting the crap with us and talking about the Broncos, that's what we love. That's what we really need from you guys, and that's what really builds up this community. Don't even worry about the, the monetary amount. Anything you can do or can't do, it's totally fine. We appreciate you regardless, though, Blake. Uh, JP dropping in $5. We appreciate you, JP. Thank you so much. He goes, hear me out. Melvin Gordon and Philip Lindsay in this offense can be exactly like Kamara and Ingram in New Orleans back in 2017-2018. Agree. Uh, that would presuppose that Melvin Gordon is as good as Alvin Kamara and Philip Lindsay is as good as, as uh, uh, Mark Ingram. I don't know that they're that good collectively. I think they're more akin to Melvin Gordon and Austin Eckler. In the, with the Chargers. I think that's the setup the Broncos wanted to go with, having the, the workhorse, the, the back, between the tackles and Melvin Gordon, the three-down running back who can catch passes, he can pass block, he can run the football. And then you have the dynamic playmaker, the the, the X factor, the wild card, like Phillip Lindsay. So they, if, if all things go according to plan, they can, they can be dynamic. They can feed off each other. I would stop short of saying Kamara and, and Mark Ingram, though. I would say more so Eckler and Melvin Gordon from the Chargers. Uh, Terry dropping in again. Thank you so much, Terry. We, you're a bona fide, bona fide for sure. Mountain Rushmore superstar. We appreciate you each and every day, each and every podcast. Judy will top 1,000 yards and seven TDs. I'm going to go the under. And don't crucify me. I, I just I think with the, the the glut of weapons the Broncos have, Corbin Sutton will be a twelve hundred yard guy, no question. He's going to be an All Pro as far as I'm concerned. But then you have Melvin Gordon. Then you have Philip Lindsay. Then you have KJ Hamler. Then you have Noah Fant. There's just so many mouths to feed and so many reps to go around. How do you? satiate everyone how do you feed everyone how do you get the ball in jerry judy's hands to the point where he's going to be a thousand yard receiver on top of Cortland Sutton? now i'm not saying it's it's not going to happen i'm not saying there's no chance if drew lock takes that massive leap forward and he throws for four thousand yards they will have two thousand yard receivers and jerry judy will top a thousand yards seven touchdowns though i think will happen i think he's going to be a guy who can take a quick hit over the middle and take it to the house and having Cortland Sutton opposite him is going to just pay immediate dividends. I, I'm i going to go 950 yards and seven touchdowns. It's a, just a skosh under 1,000, but regardless, you are going to see an instant impact from Judy and Locke, Judy and Sutton, Locke and Sutton. It's going to be a fun offense to watch from week one on. Uh, Geo, George, drop in again. Thank you so much, George. Drop in 10 bucks. We appreciate you. Uh, no matter what, we need to pay Lindsay. You know, uh, this is a very divisive topic. It's funny because a year ago, everyone and their mother wanted the Broncos to lock down Philip Lindsay. Every single person said, he's the guy, He, this is the guy we needed all along. Then they signed Melvin Gordon to a $16 million contract. He's one of the highest paid running backs in the NFL. Now they're all saying, oh, he can walk. He's going to be a restricted free agent. We don't need him anymore. That's the wrong approach to take. This is a guy who worked his way up from six string on the depth chart to being a pro bowler and a two-time thousand-yard rusher in his brief stint in his career and not a lot of talent around him. Look at the quarterbacks that Philip Lindsay's played with. Look at the supporting cast or lack thereof that Philip Lindsay had. It's not easy doing what he's done, taking that pounding week in and week out, especially coming off that wrist injury. I agree, though. This is a guy who's earned his dues, who's, who's earned his money, 
And you know what? I'll say it again for the same reason the Broncos should sign Justin Simmons to a long-term contract. It sends the right message. They cannot keep trading away the Broncos. They're, they're, they're studs. They traded, you know, uh, Emmanuel Sanders. They got rid of Aqib Tlaib back in. They've gutted their roster from the Super Bowl days and haven't paid me one. And it sends the wrong message that no matter how good you do, no matter how much blood, sweat, and tears you put in, you're not going to get paid. That's the wrong message to send. I'm not saying make Philip Lindsay the highest paid running back in the NFL. It's a dying position in terms of a one running back system. You don't really pay running backs like Ezekiel Elliott. He was overpaid last year. Christian McCaffrey, he got a big contract. You don't really like to do that. But how do you how do you pay and justify Melvin Gordon, an outside player, $16 million, eight a year, and not pay your homegrown stud who's done nothing but literally and figuratively put the Broncos on his back and made the Broncos at least semi-relevant to this point. I'm with you. I think before he hits free agency next offseason, he needs to get a contract. Uh, Zyka dropping in $5. We appreciate that. Love your passion, Zach. Thank you. It seems like there's a lot of people drinking the Drew Lock hatery lately. What's your take on that? Just curious. Let them hate. I, I, I encourage it. Let the Broncos be counted out. Let Locke be counted out. I, he's only going to respond to that. The Broncos are only going to respond to that with fury. It's the same mentality that Jarrell Casey's taking. That can be retroactively applied to the Broncos team, the Broncos locker room. He thinks he was just started like a piece of trash. And Drew Locke must be thinking in his private moments, why am I being hated on? Why am I being criticized for a redraft? Why am I being, you know, clowned by, by Browns fans of all people? He knows that he's a human being as well. The Broncos hear it. It, it doesn't go unnoticed with them. The whiteboard is slowly being filled up, and you want that. They thrive on that. You don't want the Broncos to read their own press clippings. You don't want the Broncos to get comfortable. You don't want the Broncos to get complacent or, or locked to rest on his 4-1 and laurels last season. You want the hate. Let them guzzle the hater right by the gallons. This is going to make the Broncos and Locke better. It's going to make the Broncos be a playoff team for next season and beyond. So let them, let, let it, let them hate. Hashtag let them hate. Uh, Eddie dropping in $2. We have time for a few more questions, guys, and we'll wrap it up for tonight. Eddie dropping in uh, $2. We appreciate you, Eddie. Just want to say you're awesome. Thanks for doing this pod. I, that's that's so humbling to hear, and I, I do appreciate that. It's not my first time. Like I said, I've been doing – I did Facebook Lives back in the day solo. It, it's nothing too foreign to me, but I obviously prefer to have chat on here. Like I said, we're just – I think we're just a good one-two punch, but uh, we appreciate you, Eddie. All right, I'll uh, I'll I'll take one more. One more question. What do we got? Then we'll hop off for today, and we'll be back on Tuesday. Or uh, Chad and I will be back on Wednesday, but you'll get a, a Broncos pod tomorrow as well. What do we got? Sleek Tro, good question. Will Juwan Winfrey or Fred Brown make the final roster? I don't see it. If there's going to be a receiver who's going to make the sixth spot, if they even keep six wide receivers, it's got to be uh, Deontay Spencer. It's not going to be Jawan Winfrey. I didn't really understand that selection to begin with. The Broncos traded up for the guy, and he's kind of unspectacular. He doesn't do anything overly well. So I don't know why the Broncos made that move. He was a practice squad guy last year. I think he'll be a practice squad guy this year. Fred Brown, you know, he's kind of a jag as well. So if the Broncos weren't stocked at wide receiver, I could see them making having a shot for it. But they drafted three wide receivers. They got two receivers in the first two rounds, two of the best receivers in the draft class. That, that was kind of a major indictment, I would say, on the incumbent receivers from last season. Uh, but I think that is going to do it though for tonight's huddle up podcast. Thank you all for tuning in with me tonight. I know it was kind of different people asking about, uh, where Chad went and it, why am I going rogue tonight? Not going rogue. Chad had internet con connectivity issues. He had an outage in his area. He couldn't make it tonight. He was on here at the beginning, but he was glitching out. He hopped off, but he is listening. He is commenting. He's in the chat. He will be back on the, in the saddle with me on Wednesday for a normal podcast we're going to continue our 7K week, our 7K special, uh, talk about our favorite Broncos moments. Chad's going to have his favorite Broncos moments, you know, for, pretty much for his life. I'm going to have my favorite Broncos moments since 2015. It's going to be a fun time, uh, but he'll be back on Wednesday for a normal podcast. But be, be sure to follow, as you see on the screen, the main account, the Huddle Up Pod, at Huddle, Huddle Up Pod Podcast. Be sure to follow me at Kelberman NFL, Chad at Chad N. Jensen. And if and when you can, be sure, as you see on the bottom there, go to HuddleUpPod.com if you can. No problem if you can't. Get yourself some swag. 
Get yourself a hat, get yourself a shirt, get yourself a mug, get yourself a face scar. If you want to support the brand, it's all right there. Uh, we got a question about a, a jacket. We're going to try to get look into that. Also, some kids' merchandise. And also, if you can't do that, if you can't pick up any merchandise, we totally understand that. At least, at the very minimum, subscribe to the podcast, like the podcast, share the podcast. Do not exit out of this pod tonight. Do not exit out of this video without dropping a like. We it, it helps us immensely. It helps the podcast grow, reach a bigger audience. And that's how we're going to get to 10K, 15K, and beyond. So we definitely appreciate all your contributions. But I think uh, that's pretty much it for tonight. Uh, like I said, Chad and I will be back on Wednesday for our normal Huddle Up Pod. Hopefully his internet will be working again, continue our 7K special. Hopefully you guys uh, enjoyed our, our little rogue solo pod tonight. Let me know in the comments if you if you liked it. Reach out to me on Twitter. Let me know the feedback. But uh, we'll, uh, I guess we'll see you guys on Wednesday. Have a nice night.